ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Bloom the Podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning in to yet another episode of Season 2. We are so happy that you guys are here. If you are new here and joining us for the first time, welcome. Happy to have you as part of the Bloom family. I am your host, Donovan. This is my sister and co-host, Ashley Okada. What's up? And we are excited to be back in the Bloom studio today. And boy, do we have a fun one. Um, I hope you guys have been sticking around for all of our uh, latest episodes. Last week, we had our first official guest on season two, Kelly Bunch, joined us to talk about transparency. So if you guys didn't see that episode, make sure you go back and check that out. It was a really fun one. Um, But yes, jumping in straight to today's episode, we're going to waste no time because there's a lot of ground to be covered here. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about... (laughs) we're gonna be talking about toxic masculinity Mm. hope no one got triggered just by me saying that word but (laughs) that's what we're going to be talking about today because i think that this topic influences the church more than people would like to admit i think that we have definitely got way too comfortable with throwing around terms like this with little to no backing and really to no little to no understanding on what these terms mean, how they're implied, and what the implications are for men of the church and for women of the church as well. Um, So we're going to jump straight into it. I'm going to pass it off to you. When you hear the term toxic masculinity, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Um, So honestly, the first thing that comes to mind is just how the world would use that word Mm -hmm. um which would just be a male who you know expects his wife to submit to him or anything like that would be a toxic male um but if we're actually thinking of the real definition of toxic masculinity the first thing that would come to mind would just be someone who abuses their authority or you know being a male like i think of it more like in a marriage standpoint like abusing their power over their wives and things Mm. um, because it's like, I'm a male, I can do whatever the heck I want. And, you know, it's very like, I don't know, it's this this super big confidence that almost makes it seem like they're just so insecure that they are, you know, (laughs) like like the guys that drive the really big trucks. It's like, "Hmm." exactly. (laughs) Like they're like trying to compensate for how insecure they are that they're like not manly. Interesting. (laughs) Okay. Um, (laughs) No, I definitely get that. I think that's a little bit more of a pointed view, like directly towards marriage. When I think of toxic masculinity, at least when I'm thinking of it from the world using it, I generally hear it used in a way that's like um, basically anything a man does that is manly. (laughs) Well, not only that, so anything a guy does that is stereotypical of a man. So like one of the big ones, trying to just use an example, is a man that is not a homosexual that is, you know, very clear that he's not homosexual. I feel like that's one of those things where they turn into like, oh, well, you're just not confident in your masculinity. If and you, you don't can't wear comp- a dress. Right. And you can't <laughs> say that guys are beautiful and you don't wear nail polish and you don't do these things. And mm-hmm. it's like, mm, that's not, you know, that's, <laughs> there's so much to be said on that. But that's generally when I hear it, when it's like men doing traditional men things or like, I guess stereotypes type man things would probably be the best way to put it like sports and stuff yeah doing regular things and basically getting flack for it Mm -hmm. and then also on like what you were saying in the relationship aspect where it's kind of just like domineering just like treating it like the 50s where it's like woman is the doormat yeah like like you can't speak it's definitely for me i've seen the most toxic masculinity in traditional christian homes that's a great question because I was going to ask and I wasn't sure what you were going to say, but that's a good answer (laughs) because do you think that toxic masculinity is a real thing? That's 100%. So funny that you asked that because I feel like it's a tricky thing to say as a believer to be like toxic masculinity is a thing because we think of the world's definition of what toxic masculinity is. Right. But then ever since I got on social media (laughs) and I saw the traditional lifestyle of a lot of like people and couples. I saw just how toxic a man can be when he thinks like 
the way he thinks about traditional living and being a traditional man mm -hmm. is like literally just straight up abuse of power just in every single way abuse in speech abuse in everything and it's like i'm a man like that's it you know that whole attitude yeah. that comes with it mm -hmm. it's like mind-blowing to me and i know like from a girl's perspective it can be like but is it really but like i've shown nikki and stuff and he's like that's insane <laughs> like <laughs> we're both just like i mean i've seen <laughs> some of it just from the little that you've showed me yeah it's and crazy some of the people out there are way out of pocket <laughs> so crazy crazy but they would say that that's you know how a man should be if right. he's going to be manly right so. i think and i don't know if we're saying the same thing just in different ways because i would say that i wouldn't call it toxic masculinity it's when just toxic <laughs> that's literally what i was about to say because yeah. the the man trying to assert leadership and like trying to do those things in and of itself is not a bad thing right it's about how you go about it. So when I think toxic masculinity, I don't necessarily think like the abuse of power. I just think that it's an irresponsibility with the power that you have or irresponsibility with the role. It has bad motives as well. Right. It has everything to do with the heart motive rather than the masculine frame as it would be. Because I think that's what the world tries to do is they try to frame masculinity as a whole as being the issue with society. And that's one of the things that I looked up before we started this was the definition of toxic masculinity, not in a, like, I don't know if it was Urban Dictionary or, you know, whatever <laughs> comes up as, like, the definition on Google. Right. And the definition was a set, of a, a set of attitudes and ways of behaving stereotypically associated with men that have a negative impact on society as a whole. Do you have a negative impact on society? Well, given this definition, I would say I'm a, I'm a menace. <laughs> I'm a straight up menace to society because they try to put, I mean, and that's such a broad stroke thing, right? Like a set of attitudes and ways of behaving stereotypically associated with men. So basically any of the general roles that are fulfilled by men, they're right. broad brush stroking saying this is toxic and this is having a negative impact on society as a whole. Right. which is crazy <laughs> right so with that definition and then you take the general regular definition of masculinity to kind of contrast that it's a lot more bland but it's just straight to the point qualities associated with men and these uh, examples i'm about to give are off the the dictionary page or google page uh, qualities are associated with men, i.e. handsome, leaders, driven, muscle. You threw in the handsome part, huh? No, that was the first one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was the first one. Yeah, sure. So you see very strong characteristics for masculinity just as describing the word. So with toxic mas masculinity, they're taking these traits of men and saying that they're bad. So... It's, it's very important to, to, to nip this in the bud as quickly as possible because these things are not bad traits. Right. But I think with it's kind of in the same realm, though. The only reason I would still call it toxic masculinity and not really beat around the bush with it is because we talk about it in the same way for women. Feminism is oh, toxic man. and horrible. And yeah. no one's going to be like, but can we really say it? Because being feminine and like you know all that stuff or like s what the feminist movement started with in the very beginning mm -hmm. was stuff we needed right right but i'm never gonna hesitate to be like feminism is toxic right now like right. in this moment it sucks but if you look <laughs> at the traits of feminism right what are the traits it would probably be you know standing up for things you know having a voice right or things like that i mean it would probably be some of the actual toxic stuff but i'm sure it would name decent qualities right of a well when i think of feminism i think of women trying to assert themselves with these masculine traits but that's what you think of it now well yeah so i'm saying t <laughs> feminism now is basically women trying to assert masculine traits on themselves they've put men as the standard of social hi hierarchy if you will and they're trying to put themselves on that even plane as if there's some kind of delineation that men are better than women so feminism is like in one breath they're trying to be men but they're also putting men down at the same time so you can't have it both ways but i think the interesting thing about it is that 
with the feminism trying to assert so many of these masculine traits onto themselves, how can you not also say that that's toxic? If yeah. all of these traits are having a negative impact on society as a whole. <laughs> <laughs> questions that beg to be asked here, guys. Yeah. So maybe a better word for it would be a toxic machismo. <laughs> a toxic machismo. Honestly, I would just say a toxic individual. Because, right. I mean, there's going to be people in every people group. But see, the problem with that is, is the people who are toxic are the people who are trying so hard to be masculine and they think that that's the definition of masculine. That's why it's called right. toxic masculinity. Right. So that's why it makes sense. And that's why in my mind, it's okay to use that wording. Because in their mind, that's what masculinity is. And it's a good thing to them. You see what I'm saying? Yes. It's like if I thought, you know, feminism was feminine. Right. Then I'd be like, you know, I'm like super feminine. You'd be like, that's toxic feminism. I don't know. what <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I <laughs> guess I just, I don't see it on the other side because women, the traits of women are never viewed in a negative light. Apart they from are by toxic well, well, <laughs> well, that's what I was gonna say. Apart from when a toxic man is expecting those feminine traits out of the woman, mm. at a, a at an unreasonable uh, level. Well, they they talk down, and you know, you're a maid, right? Because the <laughs> other interesting thing about this as as well is, I feel like they want to associate because if to say this is toxic, you have to you have to put something else on, right? It's the put off, put on. So if you're not going to be masculine, what are you going to be? There's only two options. So like you mentioned before, when you see all these guys, RIP Russell Westbrook, wearing a dress. Russell Westbrook wore a dress? Yeah. I was very saddened by that. Harry Styles wearing a dress. You have all these people wearing nail polish. Look, I mean, looking absolutely ridiculous. They're trying to associate all of these feminine traits and put them on the man to counteract this negative impact on society that all the accepting of everything. Right, and that's just ridiculous yeah. because yes. what we're doing is we're weakening men as a whole by stripping away their natural bents as masculine men and projecting all of these really not so manly traits onto them and now that's yeah. not to say that every man is going to be like oh i just eat fifty thousand ounces of steak every night and i drink <laughs> 40 beers while i'm watching a football game on my tractor playing a banjo like no that's not how that works so yeah. there's levels to it and each person has their own uh personality and their own levels but I think trying to make men feel like they have to act a certain way in order to not be toxic is just a toxic thing in itself. See, and that's the whole, the really hard part about it is these toxic males, their main goal is to say that you shouldn't be like these weak men, like Harry Styles. So they take the extreme right. and they run with it, but there's like no balance to anything zero right. you know they're like they uh, they associate things that would be that should be considered manly with being feminine like maybe having more emotions mm -hmm. which that is a biblical thing <laughs> to have as a man you are not to be heartless and me and nikki did an episode about that a little while back but i think yes. we may need to do a part two because yep. it's a very important topic because a, a lot of men do feel that way that they cannot express their emotions or that's a sign of weakness and that yeah. it couldn't be further from the truth. So yeah. it, it, it's there's so many extremes. And I think bringing it back to the Bible is ultimately what we have to do, right? Because when you look at the Bible, what does the Bible say about what a man looks like? You know, you look at Jesus, you look at the apostles, you look at the biblical examples in the Bible. And what you see are characteristic traits that aren't necessarily... Like, oh, he ha he was ripped and, <laughs> you know, he could deadlift 300 pounds. He like, didn't shed a single tear. Yeah, like, we don't see that. What we see is sacrificial men, leading men, spiritual protectors. leaders, protectors, providers. And I think one of the funny words that a lot of people don't expect is meek. Mm -hmm. 
which doesn't mean you're just some, you know, you just put your hands up and you just get walked all over, but you have the control and you have the, the humility to not be a boisterous and proud yeah. and you, you're humble. You're, you're, what's the word I'm looking for? Sweet. Um, discreet. <laughs> You're discreet, sweet. <laughs> sweet as well. <laughs> sweet See, that and discreet. would be a thing that they would think guys shouldn't be associated with that. But I'm like, we love a sweet guy. <laughs> Do For we? the guys out there who are single, <laughs> y'all need to be nice, okay? But don't say that you're nice. <laughs> I'm a sweet guy. You can't say you're then nice. Then you're just a machismo. Like, I'm a sweet guy. Well, no. that's, like, <laughs> that's like me saying, like, I've been working on my humility lately. Like, you can't. I'm a really humble guy because I've been working on humility. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I've seen great strides in my humility lately. Yeah, so. Haven't you noticed? <laughs> you haven't said anything about my humility lately. <laughs> How do you feel about the term alpha male? Anyone who calls himself an <laughs> alpha male is overcompensating yep. and they want to be perceived as. Yes. And see, that's, that's the thing. Like, People are just aren't comfortable in their own skin. And I think that has a lot to do with the culture. So the culture tells you, and going back years before toxic masculinity was as big as it was, there was more of that stereotype of guys don't cry. You have to be that guy that goes up to all the girls at the bar and gets everybody, everyone's number. Like that's the alpha guy, the guy that's an entrepreneur, makes all this money, drives a big fancy car. Like yeah. that's the alpha guy versus the, beta guy that is more quiet more reserved isn't punching people at the bar when he's drunk like that's the beta Has guy <laughs> yeah so there's like all these random and not to say that there aren't qualities of leading males versus following males i think that's a better way to put it mm -hmm. because you have personalities and i think all men should be working on being leaders because that's what we're called to do as men that's one of the masculine characteristics that i think is required yeah we're supposed to be leaders that's what we're, what we're called to be so i think some people do have a bent to be more of the follower personality type where you do have some other people that are bent towards leading and that will call the shots and that will go out there and say what needs to be said so i think there are some where people get like alphas and all that like there is some very very small truths there but the terms itself, I think, are ridiculous and stupid. And if you use them, I would highly encourage you to stop. <laughs> yes. Agreed. But, Agreed. yeah, so with, with that question, I would bring it back to the church because toxic masculinity has made its way in. And we have a lot of men in the church that are not asserting themselves into their role. And as we just talked about, leading is that role. So how do we fight that? I think, like you said, the Bible has clear definition of what a man ought to be, and it's not about watching football or you know eating meat. Like that, <laughs> that stuff literally could not matter any less. But just look at the Bible's definition and think, I need to take on these attributes. Like block everything else out, and the Bible is clear. I mean, it's literally a manual for life, bro. Like. It's like building Legos. <laughs> you need to read your Bible <laughs> and you will yeah. know. And that should encourage your heart. Like, this is what I need to be like. And everything else that comes at me, oh, this is toxic. This is beta, whatever. If it's not in the Bible, then it should go in one ear and not the other. You can cry every day and, you know, be a golden guy if you're following, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the rules of the Bible, what a man ought to be. <laughs> so, and you know what? The, the Bible doesn't have all these specifics. Right. That we've made. The Bible right. is very much, here's this, this, and that. A couple of things that you just need to know for your life. Mm -hmm. It's not some book of rules of like, well, how much steak did you eat last week? Hmm? Like, yeah. it ain't like that. So yeah. that, would, that would be mine. Yeah. Yeah. I think just steering away from the culture, because the culture is really the toxic part. The, <laughs> yes. The, cult the culture is what deems X, Y, or Z a toxic thing. Yes. And when we let that influence how we think and how we live our lives versus what the Bible says on how we should be living our lives, that's when we get into the more sketchy situations and ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And in a topic kind of like this, I think it's really important because especially in these days where everything is divisive, 
and so polarized. We need as many leading men as possible. And I think what the devil is doing with this culture is stripping the church away of its fighters and of its leaders. And that's what we need to be fighting against because we need strong spiritual leaders that are going to come alongside the flock and the people of the congregation and help keep them on track. That's what the Lord has the church for. That's why he appoints people into those positions. And one thing I've seen a lot of as we've been to tons of churches between the two of us is a lot of weak leadership. And there's a lot of people that are scared of confrontation and scared of doing the things that you know, are supposed to be done. And I don't know if I can say that necessarily comes from toxic masculinity per se, but I think there definitely is that stigma of being that guy, quote unquote, that's going to go in there and start causing problems when they don't have to, or it's not necessarily, or love covers and all these things. It's like, no, no. If there's an issue going on, we need to be forward about it. We need to confront it. That's what we're called to do. And I think that's an important thing that needs to start happening and it bleeds even more even into relationships going back to what you started with we need spiritual men to lead the women in relationships if you have because in genesis 3 it's very clear that the woman is going to try and assert herself into that role and the only way to keep that at bay is to have a man that is going to also assert himself into that role to balance the scales and to lead her back to where she needs to be. And I know that's an unpopular opinion and people don't like to hear that, but the design of relationships is supposed to be the men leading the woman in the relationship, not the other way around. So it's super important that that happens and it can't happen if we're sitting here in dresses talking about (laughs) it's okay to throw away all the masculine traits because they're having a negative impact on society as a whole. Right. And I think also what you said about spiritual leader is important because half these people who are alpha male and crap, they're not spiritually, spiritually leading anybody. They're just full of themselves doing whatever the heck, but there's nothing spiritual or, you know, godly about what they're doing. It's the exact opposite of that. So as much as they think they're taking on the role of being a leader because they're, you know, dominating whatever (laughs) i mean you're really not if you're not doing it god's way which is being the spiritual leader your wife needs or leading her in a godly fashion in a Mm -hmm. way that's pleasing to him then you're actually failing (laughs) otherwise so it's important to remember that if it's not done on (laughs) god's god's rule book (laughs) then you're not doing it really at all oh absolutely yeah and that kind of makes me think too <clears throat> because in marriage, it's one thing, right? To have the man that's spiritually leading you, he's doing that effectively, you're able to submit and all that. In the pre-marriage state, when you're a woman looking for a spiritual leader, what are those, what stands out to you when you're looking for that? You mean about like, how to, what, what do you mean anymore? <laughs> like when you were looking at Nikki, right? Right. Pre-marriage. Right. As a, as a woman who's looking for a spiritual leader, what were the things that you were looking for in Nikki to say like, okay, I can see him leading me in a way where I'm not going to have to step in and like basically wear the pants. You know what I mean? Right. Cause that, I feel like a lot of people don't take that into consideration and they're just like oh well he's nice and i think he's attractive and they just go for it but the male hasn't done anything on his end to show the initiative or to take the action you know right well i think his base of making decisions Mm -hmm. was all bible based (laughs) so therefore i could trust that he wasn't just doing whatever he wanted flying by the seat of his pants doing like oh well i feel this so we're just doing that you know like it was always like okay and he wanted my opinion which made mm. me feel like I was going to be able to actually be a helpmate. Yes. Because you cannot fulfill your role as a helpmate if your husband is stepping on you 24-7. Right. So I I knew that I had to let him make the final decision. But the mm-hmm. fact that he was like, I want you to be a part of this. Like, you need to tell me what you think, even if I don't agree with it, made me feel like, okay, he actually cares about my input. 
Right. And this is how we're going to be able to do life together is because we actually value each other's opinions. Right. And that's the purpose, right? Like, I think a lot of times people think of the man as like he has to know everything in order to lead them and like he has to be able to make every decision and just have all this spiritual wealth and it's like that's not the purpose the wife and even wisdom and even apart from the wife right like even you look at the church that's why the pastors are not supposed to be pastors by themselves that's why they have elders and deacons to keep them accountable and to help them make those decisions because whether you like it or not you're a fallen man you're gonna have sinful thinking that creeps in you're gonna have maybe bad doctrine at times or maybe you're gonna be misinterpreting scripture and you need those people alongside you to steer you back on track right and see i think now even getting deeper into this when i think about toxic masculinity in uh you know a realm of believers it really is that the 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 women treat their husband as if they are god and the men are very much tr like, yeah, you should treat me like I am a god. You don't have a voice. Mm. You need to be silent about these things because I'm leading us. And if you, if you correct me about anything about myself, then you've crossed a line. You're not submissive. You're not respectful. Right. And so these women feel like they cannot say a thing, even when their husband's completely in sin. And that is the exact opposite of what a help me is literally for. So they're failing in their job as well. Mm -hmm. Everyone, no one's doing their part, which makes marriage destructive. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's one of those things where like, cause like you don't want to ultimately at the end of the day, if like your husband's technically asking you to do something that's not sin, you want to submit, right. but that doesn't mean you submit without voicing your concern or without yep. voicing the biblical reason behind your concern. Because I feel like a lot of people, like you said, just blindly are like, okay, like he told me to do it and I'm going to do it. And like, in one sense, I commend the desire to want to be a submissive wife. But at the same time, you're doing yourself and your husband a disservice because not only are you letting him go in unchecked sin or in a terrible idea that could be easily avoided by you voicing your opinion to be the helpmate you're supposed to be, but also your husband thinks that he, he's right about everything and be, can become self-righteous and prideful and just perpetuate that problem even more than it already is there. Mm -hmm. So like, there's so many negatives to letting that go unchecked and just letting man go on their own way like that's not that's not what we're supposed to be doing yep. so yeah it's very important that people keep each other accountable on their actions and people take responsibility and that's kind of my closing thought mm -hmm. or closing uh segment here that we can get into is i think that's one of the big traits of masculinity that i also think of is assuming responsibility mm -hmm. and this c can go in the very large scale sense of leading church and leading people leading wife and that can also go into the really practical sense really immediate sense of get a job go out provide make effort to advance your life you know like there's a lot of like little things that i feel like just come with being a man that should be automatic for you to want to do and to desire to do and I feel like a lot in this day and age, excuse me, uh, in this day and age, there's just so much avoidance of responsibility and anything to shift the responsibility onto someone else or to do the bare minimum. Yep. And that to me is really toxic. Blame woman for all your problems. It's blame women, blame society, blame everyone but yourself. And as men, and that's one of the funny things too about relationships. You look at the themes of the Bible. When Eve sins and eats the fruit, right? Who does God go to? He goes to Adam because he's the spiritual leader. And that's the theme that you see throughout all the relationships in the Bible. The man leads and is responsible, even if it's not directly his fault, right? He's still the one that he's the head of the company. <laughs> And Adam was like, she made me do it. <laughs> right. Defers the responsibility. And that's one thing that we can't do as men is defer that responsibility. We need to assume that, take charge, and not second guess our actions or always regret our actions, but learn from them. So even when we make a mistake or when we do something that we maybe shouldn't do or, you know, anything that's on the negative side, taking responsibility for that too, not just the positive things of, yeah, I got this job, yeah, I'm leading this, this, and that, but also the negative 
of, yes, I'm owning this sin or I'm owning this mess up and I'm going to take it, learn from it and, and keep going. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's something that's very lost in today's age of victimization of everybody. Everyone's a victim. Everyone is, uh, oppressed by something or someone and that just can't be it just can't be if especially for a christian we're slave to nothing we're slave to nothing the lord has freed us from our sin that we have no oppressor we're free in christ and for that i would say we just need to take responsibility for our actions and live as free christian men and that's the best thing we can do i don't know if you have any closing thoughts on that okay well there you have it, guys. Feel free to interact with us on this topic. I know this is a more uh, hot button, I guess you could say, type of topic. But I think it was a really fun conversation. I hope you guys join in with us. Feel free to leave a comment. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And stay tuned for next week's episode. See you later.